Hello. Welcome um, to this super short 30-minute talk uh, called David's Top 5 Objects in the New Museum. Um, so the, the New Museum is going to be jam-packed with, with lots of new objects. Uh, there'll be lots of them that you're very familiar with, uh, but there are also plenty that you probably won't have seen before. Um, so as a bit of a preview, the, uh, this is my top five uh, new objects and stories that will appear in, in the New Museum of Oxford. I had a list of around 20 that I really like, um, but this is five of those 20, essentially. Oh, and that's, uh, that's a nice picture of the spaces. Uh, just getting prepared. So my first object is uh, a Tintin comic. Uh, this, uh, the infamous uh, Hergé creation <clears throat> of the, the courageous Belgian reporter, uh, his faithful dog, Snowy. Uh, they don't really feature much on this uh, front cover of this French edition of the comic from 1958. Uh, but some of you will probably have already spotted who does feature. Uh, Colonel Lawrence, uh, he's on the front cover astride a camel, pointing to the distance, maybe shouting some orders by the looks of things. Uh, he's more widely known as, I'm sure you're all aware, T.E. Lawrence or uh, Lawrence of Arabia. Uh, and he features in the new museum because of his early exploits as a collector in the city. Um, as a child in his teens, he rescued many items, some of which will also feature in the new museum. Uh, he fixed broken items with plasticine uh, and then took them to the Ashmolean, who paid a small fee for his best finds. This interest in collecting, discovering and archaeology continued and is captured in the pages of this comic. Uh, so my French isn't fantastic. Uh, L'Etranger, uh, Colonel Lawrence, uh, depicts various stages of his life. So you can see on those pages, hopefully, his time at university. Um, and importantly, at the bottom of this first page here, um, we have a, a picture of him uh, involved with an archaeological dig. Uh, and the caption reads, because um, again, I needed to put this into Google Translate, uh, the young graduate went to work in the excavations of Heriopolis, which is a, a Greek site in modern day Turkey, uh, in where Lord Kitchener uh, appreciated his energy. Um, so I particularly like this item as a, a fan of comics, um, particularly Tintin, because I remember reading them a lot when I was uh, younger. Um, and as it brings to life the subject of archaeology through a, an individual story. Uh, so in the new museum, there will be plenty of archaeological stories explored, uh, such as the remains from the Roman pottery industry. Uh, but we also want to highlight and focus on how archaeology works and functions. Uh, so the more recent excavations at the Westgate have, have gone some way in demonstrating how much appetite there is for archaeological discovery in the city. Um, alongside the T. Lawrence items, we will have objects from the earlier 70s Westgate area digs on, on St. Ebbs. And some of the pottery items you might recognise from the old museum uh, will also be included. Uh, Nearby, there'll be an interactive archaeological excavation uh, where visitors will be able to dig through uh, different layers to uncover replica items of what was actually discovered during the more recent excavations. And some of you might remember the pop-up exhibition we held in the town hall. Uh, there were things like pop guns and uh, a World War I Wellington, uh, and they'll be part of explaining uh, the process of archaeology. So very exciting. So my second object is um, a sorry, is slightly mundane looking, <laughs> and you probably are asking why why this. Um, well, I think you'd be right to ask that, but also oh, sorry, I'm too far forward. Uh, I think just think about it. Uh, how many times do you see a sign asking you? Uh, telling you, in fact, to park your cycle somewhere. Um, I can't think of many occasions where I've, see, where I've seen a sign like this uh, around the city. Most of the time, there are signs telling cyclists where they can't park 
uh, particularly among the fronts of the historic buildings, on gates and fences. Um, and this object becomes more interesting still when you learn about its story. So you might have got a little sneak preview of what that was just a second ago. Uh, this is uh, Beechcroft Road, um, and this object comes from Beechcroft Road, uh, where uh, local resident Ted Devan, uh, who is creator of the TV series Bing, uh, felt that the streets of Oxford were just so dominated by cars, squeezing out pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, he led fellow residents in painting carpets on the road, uh, and installing huge planters to slow cars down. Uh, and there's some really great images online um, and videos of, of residents taking their living rooms to the curbside, uh, bringing people together uh, to respond to an issue that affects all of us. Um, I'm now gonna attempt to play a bit of audio from Ted, just to break up my, my talking here. Um, and I hope this works. Yeah, since I was a kid, I was fascinated by the... ...space between people, and I grew up in a place where property lines weren't really all that visible, and the line between private property and public property also wasn't that visible. It was, it was of no concern, and that's because there were very few cars, and when I saw my street in Oxford, one of the things that really bothered me was the way that front gardens had been ripped out to accommodate cars, which, had they been in the street, would have naturally slowed down traffic, and they would have been taken off the street, destroyed the front gardens, and then left the street area open for this terribly dangerous situation where there was just no sanctuary from cars, either in gardens or in the street. And I realized, okay, I've made a commitment to this street. I'm going to be, I'm going to go out feet first out of this house. Well, that's not what happened, but that was my thought at the time. And I better do something about this because this is just going to bug me. Because once you see the way in which roads are divided between motorists and pedestrians, you can't help but see it as an apartheid situation where the people with cars have far more of this use of this space and sterilize it for just about everyone else. Their pedestrians are real second-class citizens. That's why they're perceived as being, quote-unquote, in the way. Like, in the way of what? In the way of what? Oxford struck me as a, an open city to this because I saw the way people like Bill Heiner went from troublemaker to, to hero and was celebrated with the closest thing we get to a state funeral in Oxford, and rightfully so. And because of that, it, and a few other aspects of Oxford, I thought, look, this is a city that's part of its mind is closed, and in the past, the other part of its mind is very open, looking in the future. Let's see which way this goes. And I'm very happy with the, the results. By and large, people eventually got it and championed it, and that snowball just kept rolling. And now that I'm gone from that street, I'm delighted to see that the snowball looks like it will continue to be rolled and that 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 may go on and extend be going on long after i'm dead just like philip Pullman's shed i'm hoping you could all hear that <laughs> um yes it's uh it's it's really interesting hearing ted talk about uh, his experience and, and why he's done it. Sadly, he doesn't actually live in Oxford anymore, but I think he had a big impact on that area. Um, for me, that object demonstrates the power of local change, um, that people can enact with their neighbours, they can make a difference in a multitude of ways. Uh, creative responses on a micro level to problems that are experienced around the world are really interesting. Um, and I think it proves that everyone can make a difference. Uh, th this item will be in really good company in a, in a group of items um, and displays titled Journeys to Oxford. Uh, some of you may remember the exhibition that was uh, created in the gallery space uh, a few years ago. Um, and these displays play homage uh, to that exhibition 
uh, and expand it with a, a wide range of new stories. So alongside the Beechcroft Road stories will be insight into Florence Park and Welsh workers, uh, the story of Max Ifill, Eiffel, uh, a university student from the Caribbean, and the uh, intriguing story of the founders of Royal Cars, an Oxford taxi company. Uh, all of the people highlighted here will have journeyed to Oxford and, and have impacted the city in their own ways. My third object, uh, another slightly strange one, I suppose, um, is uh, this Mr. Thurm badge. Um, Mr. Thurm, something I was not aware of uh, before uh, local historian Liz Woolley pointed it out to me, uh, but I bought this little badge a, a little while ago. Um, it's a very small pin badge, as you can see, um, and on it you can, and you can see the character, who's called Mr. Firm. Uh, it, he was illustrated, created by Eric Fraser, and he first appeared in uh, on publicity material for the Gaslight and Coke Company in the early 1930s. Uh, he became a national figure uh, seen all over the place. Uh, and this is why I, I like this particular object. Um, gas street lighting was introduced by the Oxford Gaslight and Coke Company in 18, uh, 1819 in Oxford. Uh, the streets were lit from sunset to sunrise, except during the summer. Um, and this was fueled by the, the coal fueled uh, huge gas works in St. Ebbs. Uh, when Britain changed to using natural gas in the 1960s, the works were dismantled um, and part of the site later become, became the uh, Grand Pont uh, Nature Park. Uh, thick clay beneath the park seals in the, uh, the toxic remnants, apparently. Uh, prior to this, in 1938, the Gaslight and Coke Company moved offices to the building directly across the road from the town hall uh, into now what is above the Sainsbury's. Uh, so if you look up as you exit the front of the town hall, uh, you can see the balconies have wrought iron shapes. Uh, and in fact, they are in the shape of Mr. Thurm. Um, so uh, if you haven't noticed that before, um, I was the same. I hadn't noticed it until Liz pointed it out to me. Uh, but Mr. Firm, he, he disappeared from use when um, uh, during that time when uh, the, the gas made from coke was replaced by the cleaner natural gas. Um, and yeah, I particularly like it because I, I like seeing these small details in the sort of architecture and the buildings around Oxford uh, that relate to something um, specific or part of the city's history. Um, and, you know, it's directly opposite the town hall as well. So we can make that connection in the new museum. Uh, the pin badge will feature in a, a case uh, which explores some of the some of the services of the city uh, with a particular focus on street lighting. Um, so uh, we will have the uh, lamppost that features in the old museum, uh, as well as a lamp lighters pole and a schedule. Uh, the schedule nearly made it into this top five as well because uh, I like that it, it states uh, that on moonlit nights only half of the lamps needed to be lighted. Uh, so here we have a, an image of the last gas light uh, in Oxford being extinguished, um, and the case will also see a uh, the display will also see a revisit to the story of uh, William White, the city's engineer. Uh, but yes, that's probably a story for another time to delve into. I'm sure with your experiences in Explore Oxford, you'll be well aware of the exploits of William White. My next object, object number four, is this uh, Cinema Dorman's great coat. Um, I guess it's, it's pretty sad to think that cinemas, theatres, museums, uh, all having a pretty bad time at the moment. Uh, I, I really miss going to to the pictures. I think the whole event is always fantastic. The seats, the trailers, uh, even that the popcorn smell. Um, so let's hope there's some uh, cinemas still with us when uh, lockdown and the pandemic is uh, dealt with. Uh, but this great coat is a really lovely thing. I love the color of it. Uh, it's got some wonderful shiny buttons. Uh, and I think the thought of being welcomed to a film screening by someone wearing this 
uh, it kind of makes me feel a bit nostalgic for a time I don't think I ever experienced. <laughs> um, but this coat in particular was used by the doorman of the Ritz Cinema on George Street, which is now the Odeon. Uh, so on the buttons uh, of the coat, uh, if I go back again, although I possibly can't really see, on the buttons of the coat are um, the letters ABC in the branding for the uh, ABC cinemas, uh, standing for Associated British Cinemas. Uh, this was a chain operating in the UK between the 1930s and 80s. And uh, a doorman's role uh, would be to keep the queues orderly, patrol the exits to prevent anyone, and this is a term that I hadn't heard of before, uh, bunking in, as opposed to bunking off, I suppose, <laughs> uh, checking ages and changing the category boards, posters and signage. Um, more interesting still with this item is when we were investigating the history files, uh, which are exactly that, they're, they're ring binders in the Museum Resource Center at Stan Lake, where a lot of the objects are held. Uh, and the ring binders, the, the history files, they hold a wealth of information on many of the objects uh, that we don't generally have access to um, through just uh, an online database alone. Uh, we found this types document it made me kind of nostalgic again for uh, old uh, printers, but um, the, the files record uh, this uh, piece of paper uh, as being found in the pocket of the great coat. Uh, and this is a, a script for a tour. Um, so any tour guides with us <laughs> today. Um, and it highlights a range of aspects of the cinema. So um, it talks about where the organ would have been um, and it notes that in 1928, an organ was installed um, and it had the capability of providing sound effects for silent films, uh, such as horse hooves, cannon fire and telephone bells, um, as well as being able to provide the usual musical accompaniment. Uh, so the Great Coat will be in a section of the new museum exploring entertainment in Oxford. So alongside the Great Coat, uh, we'll have some plaster bosses from the Carfax assembly rooms, uh, another contender to be included in this list, uh, as well as a very recent item, uh, a signed set list from the band Ride during their 2019 tour, I think, unless it was earlier this year. It's very confusing to <laughs> think of this year uh, starting before the pandemic. Um, uh, and Ride were an Oxford band, uh, are an Oxford band, um, and they'll be sitting alongside that uh, Rolling Stones ticket that we've had in the gift shop all those years. Um, and again, yeah, when I was thinking about this, it made me feel a bit sad again that we haven't had any live music for such a long time. Um, and I suppose uh, cine cinemas becoming more popular, prolific, uh, I guess less of an event to some people um, means that we don't get greeted by a... Uh, someone wearing that kind of coat anymore um or maybe i don't go to the right cinemas i don't know but uh either way i think it's a a great item a great outfit um and something as winter draws in that we we will all wouldn't mind having uh to help warm us up so my final object um because i i realize a lot of these objects have been quite modern uh, I did have a fair few which were much older, but I just seem to have settled on the, the quite a lot of the new, the newer objects, I suppose. Uh, however, this one is from 1768, and uh, I find it particularly interesting. Uh, it's a document. So this is a uh, reprimand speech, um, or a reprimand sort of notice referring to a speech from the Speaker of the House of Commons uh, given in 1768. Uh, in it, the speaker talks about an incident in 1766 concerning the mayor of the time of Oxford, uh, Philip Ward. At that time, the city was in such enormous debt that the council attempted to sell its two parliamentary seats. Uh, the result of this illegal act was that the mayor and 10 councillors were sent to London's Newgate prison. Uh, but after four days, they were discharged with this reprimand. Uh, it includes some other names on there that might be familiar, such as John Treacher. Let's just see if I can show that other side. Yep. 
John Treacher and Richard Tawney, who were both mayors at one point or another. Uh, the, despite this event happening, uh, Ward actually went on to be honoured as an alderman in 1772. Um, so I suppose politicians don't really ever change. Uh, this item will be on display alongside others that explore the, his the historic division of power within the city, uh, as well as an exploration of the town hall as the seat of power. Uh, star items like the 12th century town charter, 11th century that should be, I think, <laughs> town charter, uh, will be displayed uh, alongside a fantastic mayor's hat worn by Sir Robert Buckle, uh, who was mayor when the current town hall was completed. Uh, just opposite the display, uh, we'll also have an interactive model of the town hall uh, where you'll be able to explore the different functions of this fantastic building. And if you've been on a tour or had a look around, uh, you'll understand what I'm talking about. OK, I've sort of almost kept the time, although run over a little bit. Um, that is it for my whistle stop tour.